On this day, we gather to honor the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose work as both a minister and an activist has inspired generations of African Americans and modern civil rights leaders. Without the dedication and sacrifices of Dr. King, I may not be able to be speaking to you all here today, and it is for that that I am grateful. For many years, I considered this holiday as simply an excuse to get away from the burden I made my education out to be. On the couch, I would sit, cartoons blasting in the background, as my thoughts wandered to the deepest depths of childhood imagination, and yet I never took the time to understand this meaning of today. <clears throat> it is quite ironic and disappointing that this holiday has shifted into a reason for children like myself for many years to escape the very same education that Dr. King fought, fought to earn for people of color. King himself says it best, and I quote, we must remember that intelligence is not enough. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. And I am proud to say that our institution makes this day as a chance to be hands-on with our education rather than days or hands-off. In the midst of political turmoil, threats of war, school shootings, incidents of police brutality, wrongful incriminations, climate change, terrorism, and even TikTok, I am scared for my generation. <laughs> It seems as if every day we are straying away from values such as integrity, civil discourse, and liberty, which we were established for this, gen or this nation by our founding fathers. But with that being said, I pose a question. Why are those outdated values the standards we hold ourselves to? Because it's socially correct? Because society tells us to? Well, society also once told us that the enslavement of African Americans was acceptable and that the dehumanizing of fellow human beings was expected. The point that I'm trying to make is that society sets constraints for our lives. Whether we are aware of them or not, they do exist. We are all born into social class, government systems, racial classifications, and stereotypes that if followed attempt to clip our wings. Who's truly in today's world is doing the right thing? Yes, there are occasional acts of kindness, which we all retweet or like on Facebook in order to sell a version of ourselves that we want others to see, rather than admitting that we are afraid of being the outlier. We fear our differences because that's what makes us outcasts. But with the new decade, decade upon us, I offer a solution to this. We embrace those differences. How is it that some of the best leaders in history, such as Gandhi, Mother Teresa, and Dr. King, motivated those around them with only their words? King himself was inspired by nonviolence and protesting through civil disobedience. We should be ashamed that we, the human race, now feel the need to resort to violence as a means of making our voices heard. All it takes is one voice to be heard in order to shock the world. We must learn that life is not black and white, but rather that everything that is in between. For example, being biracial myself has provided me with a unique perspective, as I am the embodiment of two races coming together. An article written by Jennifer Latst entitled The Biracial Advantage discusses that people of mixed race experience both advantage and challenge. Latson continues on stating that one of the most vexing parts of the multiracial experience is being asked, what are you? If we all responded to that question, no answer would be quite the same. In this room are mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, teachers, students, bosses, mentors, friends, enemies, but most importantly, human beings. Our race is an adjective meant to describe us, not a word meant to confine or oppress us, enslave us, or subject us to the acts of discrimination beyond belief. As I am a product of a white mother and a black father, I am no better or no worse than any of you. If there were more focus on what makes us similar, not what makes us different, we would see positive change in our lives. It amazes me that such a small thing, such as the amount of melanin in a person's skin, has created such a chasm between people. Dr. King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. So I beg you to hug those you hold dear, pull them close, learn to laugh instead of cry, learn to forgive rather than hold a vendetta, learn to apologize instead of fight, learn to understand someone rather than or tolerating them, and learn to love thy neighbor. I can tell you now that a life full of vengeance will end in regret, whereas a life spent loving will be worth all of the bumps and bruises along the way. <clears throat> it is foolish to expect the peace that we lack, or it is foolish to expect world peace when we lack basic respect for our fellow human beings. We must ask ourselves, in the end, how do we want to be remembered? Many great milestones have been set since Dr. King's time. Oprah, Oprah became the first African American female to become a billionaire. Mae Jemison and Guyon Bluford were the first. African-American female and male to travel to space. Barack Obama was elected as the first black president, and this past year, the most diverse Congress in US history was elected to office. Vanessa Williams was the first black woman to win Miss America, and now this past year, Miss USA, Miss America, Miss Teen USA, Miss Universe, and Miss World were all women of color. Just to name a few, let us be better than those who came before us and pave the way for the next generation to not live in fear of political turmoil, threats of war, school shootings, incidents of bruta or police brutality, wrongful incriminations, climate change, terrorism, and for the love of God, please not TikTok. 
I am honored to be able to speak to you all afternoon. Uh, thank you. Um, now there will be some words from Dr. Roberts. Thank you, uh, Isaiah, for, for those um, wonderful words. I appreciate you being here to speak today. And I also want to welcome all of our students, faculty, and staff, uh, and guests to the closing event of today's uh, um, celebration of the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. It's wonderful to have everyone here on this special day. Uh, and I want to thank you for your efforts, as Isaiah mentioned, for helping make uh, Dr. King's birthday here at NCSSM as a day on. Uh, so as we um, uh, are, are very fortunate with us this afternoon that you'll get to hear from in just a, just a few minutes to have Pierce Freelon as our keynote speaker here today. Mr. Freelon is an educator, musician, and uh, Emmy Award uh, winning producer, a social entrepreneur, and an activist who lives here in Durham but whose work not only has an impact locally but, uh, and in our state, but nationally and internationally. Mr. Freelon represents the next generation of leaders who are working so hard to continue and expand the dream of Dr. King in the context of our world today. Mr. Freelon's running for the North Carolina Senate to bring his progressive voice to state leadership, and so we thank you uh, to, for being here today and taking time out of your busy schedule to, to share your words with us. I also want to thank our students and staff uh, for, for making uh, the celebration uh, of Dr. King's life a work, a work day of learning, a discussion, and support for others throughout our community. Through your efforts today, NCSSM, NCSSM is celebrating the life of Dr. Uh, King and his legacy of caring and service for others. I'd, I'd especially like to thank Mr. Plummer, Dr. Brandon, uh, Mr. Lynch, Sue Ann Lewis for their leadership in planning today, Mr. Rowe for his tech support, and the many faculty and staff who've planned the activities that we've all been able to participate in. I hope each of us through our efforts today can see how organizations as well as individuals can support and give back to our communities and make our communities a place better for all. On this day that we celebrate the life of Dr. King for his efforts to ensure that all people in this country have the ability to live their lives, pursue their passions, and achieve their dreams based on their abilities and character, and not the color of their skin. In the more than 50 years since Dr. King's death, there has certainly been hard-won and significant progress made in increasing the rights and opportunities for many people who prior to the work of Dr. King had none. That's why when we look back and count the progress we, and celebrate Dr. King's legacy, yet when we think about today and look forward, we understand the work that's left to all of us if we hope to realize Dr. King's dream. As I think about where we are in achieving Dr. King's dream and what he referred to as the beloved community, a society based on justice, equal opportunity, inclusiveness, and a love of one's fellow human beings, it seems that in many ways we're moving in the wrong direction. Whether through new laws at the state or national level that curtail the rights of individuals or group based on race, ethnicity, uh, race or ethnicity, or uh, gender, gender identity or sexual orientation, uh, we don't seem to be moving in the right direction. In the past five, in the past five, not only those items, but the fact that we see a greater and growing uh, income disparity across our country. So it certainly doesn't seem that we're closer to achieving Dr. King's dream. Just in the past five decades since the passing of Dr. King, the top 1% of earners in the U.S. have nearly doubled their share of national income, with the top 10% earning 10 times more than the bottom 90%, and the top 1% earning 30, 39 times more than the bottom 90%. Income inequality is also pervasive not only between the top earners and others, but exists based on gender and race, with women earning less than men on average, and black and Latino work workers earning 30% less than white and Asian workers. So even as we can celebrate the work of Dr. King during the Civil right, Rights Movement and the progress toward equal rights that has been made, we surely have far to go to achieve what was envisioned in a beloved community. So how do we get there? The progress achieved during the Civil Rights Movement and since was in large part due to the tremendous leadership and voices and actions of, of those leaders such as Dr. King and many others. 
Just recently, I've been reminded of the importance of those voices as we, as we have lost or contemplate losing some of the greatest of these voices. Just in the past couple of weeks, we learned that Representative John Lewis has advanced stage pancreatic cancer. Representative Lewis was not only one of the most influential leaders of the civil rights movement beginning in his early 20s, he has served in Congress for more than 30 years where his voice and leadership for our nation has earned the respect of all such that he is referred to as by his colleagues and many others as a genuine American hero and the moral conscience of American leaders. Lewis defined the beloved community by breaking it into parts. Beloved meaning not hateful, not violent, not uncaring, and not unkind. Community meaning not separated, not polarized, not adversarial. John Lewis's voice has been loud and his actions courageous and impactful for nearly 60 years. We need more John Lewis's. We also lost Representative Elijah Cummings this year who was an outspoken civil rights advocate and an advocate for low-income people. Like Lewis, he earned the respect of all of his colleagues for his principled advocacy for what was right for all people. To the very end, he stood up against power and his grace and moral character stood and, stood and stands in sharp contrast to those, to those whom he disagreed with. And finally, we lost Toni Morrison this year, widely considered to be one of the greatest writers of our time through her works such as The Bluest Eye, Song of Solomon, and Beloved. Morrison chronicled the lives of black people and particularly black women with frankness and honesty that resonates around the world. Respect for her work and her influence earned her the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1993 and the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2012. So as we contemplate the loss of such powerful voices as those of Lewis Cummings and Morrison, it's hard but not to wonder who the new voices are that help, us, help take us from where we are to where we must go to, uh, to greater reflect that of the beloved community. It's so important that we continue to have leaders today with strong voices and commitment to action like Mr. Freelon or North Carolina's own Reverend Dr. William Barber Jr. who was awarded a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant in 2018 for his work as one of the nation's leading voices for the struggle for racial and economic, against the struggle for racial and economic disparity. I'm proud to be at NCSSM where I believe that we are striving to provide the type of education and community that Dr. King believed necessary to help create citizens and leaders capable of understanding and solving problems with great intellect and even greater passion and caring. As Isaiah mentioned earlier, Dr. King believed that it was critical that education was more than just being smart or academic knowledge. It was about having uh, both intelligence and character. We're, in, we're, now, we're in need now more than ever of citizens and leaders who demonstrate both. On this, day, on this day, it's hard for me not to think about the work and words of Dr. King, his own courage, thoughtfulness, intelligence, and conviction without lamenting a lack of these things on almost a daily basis in the words and actions of some leaders in our country, whether through Twitter, TikTok, or whatever that might be. I urge each of us as individuals and together to remember the life and work of the man we are celebrating today and the many others who have worked to understand and find common ground over the past five decades. Let us strive as individuals and all of us collectively to the better angels to which Lincoln appealed in his, in his first inaugural address and be the leaders that you are and will be in helping ensure that our society stays on the path Dr. King helped forge more than 50 years ago toward a more beloved community. So again, thank you for all you have done today and what you do every day for each other and our community as we celebrate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. At this time, I would like to welcome the NCSSM Colors Gospel Choir under the direction of Mr. Leon Goldston for a musical selection. Thank you again.
in the name of the Lord. I'm going to move. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you the keynote speaker, Mr. Pierce Freelon. If I could describe Mr. Freelon in one word, I would say he is multifaceted. A Durham native, Mr. Freelon is a professor, director, musician, and Emmy Award winning producer. Mr. Freelon is the son of Philip Freelon, a well-known architect, and Miss Nina Freelon, a world-renowned jazz singer and producer. Upon graduating high school, Mr. Freelon attended the University of Chapel Hill, where he majored in African and African American studies and designed a hip hop curriculum taught to students around the world. After earning his master's in Pan-African Studies from Syracuse University, Mr. Freelon developed the Bebop to Hip Hop program for the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz and co-founded Beat Making Lab, an Emmy Award winning PBS web series. He eventually co-led efforts to create Next Level, a multi-million dollar partnership between UNC Chapel Hill and the US Department of State that sends hip hop artists abroad for cultural diplomacy and conflict resolution. Mr. Freelon was a political organizer and hip hop coordinator for a nonpartisan nonprofit organization called Voices for Working Families, where he led voter registration and education among 18 to 35 year olds across North Carolina. He is the director of the North Star Church of the Arts and has taught in the Department of Political Science at North Carolina Central University and in the Departments of African, African American, and Diaspora Studies at UNC Chapel Hill. He formerly served on the boards of the Durham Library Foundation, National Museum of Art, and Kid Z Notes, and is currently the vice chair of the Durham Human Relations Commission. Mr. Freelon lives in Durham with his wife and two kids and still continues to make a difference in our community, state, and nation. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. P Pierce Freelon. Give it up for that awesome choir one more time. They were great, so great. Thank you, uh, Terry Lynch, for uh, reaching out to me and inviting me to be here. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Roberts, for um, you know opening things up. And both of the student presenters, was it Isaiah and Wisdom? Okay, them, give them another big round of applause, too. <clears throat> awesome, awesome. <laughs> In fact, I'm feeling super self-conscious about my remarks because the y'alls were just so amazing orators. Um, so yeah, thank you. I, I want to start as uh, at the risk of sounding cliche uh, in honor of Dr. King and, and doing some dreaming. Yesterday at North Star Church of the Arts, we had a service led by a radical black feminist named Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums, and she did something that I want to try out here. Uh, first of all, I want to do some breathing because from what, what I've heard so far, what I've felt from the choir, what I've the vibration in the room, I just want to do some breathing and, and to sit with that. And I want us all to, to think about, I'm going to ask you to think about something 
a dream that you have, something that you want to manifest. Um, so first, let's all just take a big collective breath together. Breathe in. All right. On the second breath, I want everyone to exhale audibly. All right. So breathe in. Okay. Now on this third breath, I want you to think about a dream that you have, something that you want to change or create or amplify or manifest. Take a minute to think about what that thing is. And then we're going to breathe in together and out audibly one more time. All right. Now, a good friend of mine says, words create worlds. So you've thought of this thing. I want you to find someone in the room, whoever you're sitting around next to you, close to you, tell them, you have 30 seconds, tell the person next to you what the thing you're going to manifest is right now. Go. All right, now let's switch it up. So if you were talking, let's switch and let the other person speak. You got 30 more seconds. Go. All right. Okay, I hope everyone, I hope everyone got a chance to speak. Um, let me hear y'all say words create worlds. Words create worlds. Yes, we can speak things into existence. And you as young folks especially are at a great point in your life to start manifesting things. So I thought that would be a really important and powerful way uh, to start things off. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Did y'all hear some interesting things from the people around you? Okay, good. All right. So I want to start off with a little West African vocabulary. Um, there's a word and an idea in the Akan language tree, Sankofa. Let me hear you say Sankofa. Sankofa. All right. Sankofa literally means go back and fetch it. Like if you're walking down the street and you drop something, Sankofa, you go back, you pick it up, you don't want to keep moving forward without that precious thing. And it really means you need to look back to the past in order to move forward. And in Ghana, there is this system of, of uh, symbols called Adinkra symbols, almost like hieroglyphics. They're images that represent uh, different ideas. And the image for Sankofa is a bird moving forward but looking backward. So that idea of Sankofa is something that I want to root us in today because I'm about to take y'all back, all right? We're going to go way back to when I was in your position uh, in high school, okay? A long, long time ago in a mystical, magical time called the 90s, okay? <laughs> so uh, if you're right, y'all ready to come back with me? Let me hear you say, take it back. Yeah. All right, so I need your... I need your, your teachers to help me out on this one because none of y'all were around in the 90s. Some of your teachers uh, were present, and I need your help. Uh, somebody finish, teachers, finish this line for me. I like the way you work it. Okay. <laughs> Some of y'all were there. How about this one? You are. Okay. All right. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. So that's what was hot when I was in high school. Um, y'all still want to go back? Let me hear you say, take it back. Yeah. All right, I'm going to take y'all back. How many of y'all play video games? Raise your hands if you play video games. All right. So back in my day, back in my day, video games had two buttons. It was just jump and punch. The controllers that my kids have these days, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, how many of y'all have a phone? Raise your hand if you have a phone. Okay. 
check this out. Back in my day, everyone in the house shared the same phone, and it was connected to the wall. And here's the other thing. The internet was also on that same phone line. You couldn't be on the phone and on the internet at the same time. It was a different time, OK? One more thing, speaking of internet, there was no Google, there was no Wikipedia. So if you wanted to know something, you had to ask somebody, or you had to look it up in an encyclopedia. Um, and so, and you just had to trust that the person who was telling you what was up knew what they were talking about. You couldn't really fact check. Uh, but the beautiful thing about back in my day, uh, yeah, you had to, had to look it up to get the information, you had to talk somebody, but, to someone, but with that information came the person and their personality, their own unique individual voice, their spirit came with that information. So in the oral tradition, that ancient, sacred oral tradition, I'm going to share a story with you all today about my childhood. And now that I've set some context for what the 90s were like, uh, I want to ask permission uh, to tell my story. Y'all want to hear my story about when I was in high school in the 90s? Right, let me hear you say, take it back. Take it back. All right, I'm going to take y'all back. When I was in high school, we did not celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Martin Luther King Jr. is only a, it's a relatively recent holiday. It's not like Easter, which has been recognized for over 2,000 years, or the 4th of July, which was first celebrated in 1776. Martin Luther King Day was established the year I was born, which was 1983. And before that, it, it didn't exist. And King was not always a beloved public figure like he is now. He was controversial to some. Some people called him devices, divisive, a troublemaker. And the lawmakers of this land didn't think he deserved a place alongside President's Day or Columbus Day as a national public holiday. And uh, so people had to fight. People had to fight. And even after it became a nationally recognized public holiday, private schools were under no obligation to observe it. And so I grew up in Durham. Uh, I went to school right down the street from here at E.K. Poe Elementary School. I went to Durham School of the Arts. Um, but I actually spent my last two years of high school in a boarding school, in a private boarding school in Western Massachusetts. And so when I was preparing my remarks for today, I was like, oh, let me tell them about my boarding school experience. Um, and I was one of very few black students at a privileged, predominantly white, elite high school, and up there in Massachusetts, uh, MLK Day was just a regular school day, nothing special about it. Now coming from Durham, this really surprised me because we had observed Martin Luther King Day from when I was in elementary and middle school. Uh, I celebrated Kwanzaa every year here at the Durham Armory. I went to, I saw performances with the African American Dance Ensemble. I had a very blackety black upbringing and the idea that we wouldn't celebrate King Day was just mind-boggling to me. Um, and again, the, the, in addition to the culture shock of being at a boarding school where I was all of a sudden one of very few black kids on campus. Um, and so we didn't have MLK Day, but we did have uh, a student organization. Uh, we called them affinity groups. Our affinity group, the black one, was called A4. It stood for the African American Awareness, Awareness Association which now that I think about it is like a very problematic title. Uh, it just kind of sets a tone. We weren't calling ourselves like the Black Empowerment Student Group or the, uh, you know, the African American Solidarity Building Group. We just wanted people to notice that African Americans existed. It's like, were you aware that black people were on this campus? You know, African American awareness. It was a very low bar. Um, in our A4 meetings, they weren't particularly political. It was more like a social hang. It gave black students who sat together at the lunch table a chance to play cards and listen to music and share stories. Or if you wanted to get that special somebody's phone number so you could call their mom on their landline and ask to speak to them. <laughs> you know, it would happen at A4 meetings. Um, <clears throat> but it was at an A4 meeting where I asked my friends, like, why don't we celebrate MLK Day on campus? Back home, we have the day off. I don't like it. Like, we celebrate Columbus Day, who was a murdering, thieving, disease-spreading colonizer, and we don't have a day off for King? Like, what's up with that? Um, so we got mad, and we decided to do something about it. We organized a boycott. In the spirit of Martin Luther King Jr., can you all guess what we decided to boycott? 
class. <laughs> right. So our teachers called it cutting class, but we maintained that it was a political boycott of the oppressive white supremacist power structure. That was the argument. Um, and we did it together. Everybody black. We stood in solidarity. We said, we're going to take this L together. <laughs> And while our non-black friends were in class, we were chilling like it was a Saturday, waging a peaceful protest. And uh, since we had given ourselves the day off, we decided to go to lunch. It was kind of like um, science and math where you have like shops in a town close by. So um, we decided to, uh, to walk to lunch. Um, and th this was a, an uncommon thing. You got to imagine if, if you're in class, you look outside your window, all the black kids in your school, all 20-something of us, there weren't many, um, are walking together going somewhere. We didn't realize it at the time, but it looked like we were on some kind of march or political statement. Um, in reality, they had a, a deal at Subway where you could get a six-foot sub with chips and a drink for $4.99. <laughs> but because we were black and doing it together, they were like, it's a march. And so, over the course of the day, we kind of realized what we were doing was kind of making waves on campus. The faculty began to notice uh, it was bigger than the march. It was bigger than cutting class. We realized in that moment that we had power, that we didn't have to accept things the way they were. We had the agency to change things, just like King. And if you think about the Montgomery bus boycotts, when it erupted, it was just a really simple matter. After a long day at work, Rosa Parks did not want to give up her seat for a white person. She was unhappy with the status quo, and so she sat down. She rebelled, and other members of the community followed as the black residents of the city of Montgomery joined Rosa Parks, and together they created a movement. It was a simple gesture that developed into a movement. They weren't doing anything extreme or violent. They were just breaking from the norm, from the status quo, to address a simple injustice. And through that, they changed the culture of their city, which had rep ripple effects throughout the state, across the country, and, uh, and across the globe. And likewise, in our own way, we had stumbled upon our own little protest, like the bus boycott. The fact that the school didn't recognize Martin Luther King Jr. Day was just a simple matter. It was a small injustice. It didn't seem fair. There were other bigger structural issues, but in that moment, like Rosa, who didn't feel like giving up her seat, we didn't feel like going to class, not when we were getting the days off for other public holidays. But this small act of student-led civil disobedience had consequences. It led to a conversation. The other faculty and staff noticed that their black students were missing, and so did our non-black peers. They noticed and were curious what was up. And what came out of that was a conversation, and it turned out, we didn't realize it at the time, but it turned out, that MLK, uh, the fact that we didn't recognize MLK Day was just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, that was part of it. There was also no black history being taught in our curriculum. That was something that came out of our ensuing discussion. Um, black History Month was not recognized in any significant way. And furthermore, there were no black faculty or staff on campus. So back in my day, this was, uh, it was uncommon for private schools to have, for example, like an office of multicultural affairs that bring in speakers like me on days like this. Uh, in my day, private schools are what I like to call unapologetically white. But more recently, it's been important for institutions like these to make room for diverse communities, for different races and faiths and nationalities and sexual orientations and cultures to come and have a seat at the table and be reflected in the administration to the student body. And that's what was just beginning to happen at, at my school in the 90s. So here's what happened. The African American Awareness Association formed a list of demands. On that list included things like recognizing Martin Luther King Jr. Day, getting more uh, black history into the uh, curriculum, and hiring some faculty of color, more faculty of color. There were some faculty of color, no faculty of African descent. And by the time we graduated, the school had finally formed a search committee and they hired a black faculty member and I never got to take a class with this particular uh, person that they hired, but I'm proud of the work that we did to plant the seed which would impact students for generations to come after we left. Um, and so here's the important thing. 
this change didn't just happen by itself. It didn't occur to school administrators to recognize Martin Luther King Jr. Day or to hire more diverse faculty. It came from a relatively obscure, small student affinity group that was rebelling on its own behalf. And that is very important. It was our protest that started the dialogue. And it's important that the voices of the communities most affected by oppression are centered in creating the solutions in the institutions that we um, occupy. So the other important part of the story that I want to highlight is that it is often young people who are at the vanguard of social and political movements. Martin Luther King Jr. was only 26 years old when the Montgomery bus boycotts launched. And right here in the state of North Carolina, there have been so many social and political movements led by people your age. People like the Royal Seven. Have y'all ever heard of the Royal Ice Cream Sit-In Movement? Okay, the Royal Seven. This was seven North Carolina Central University students read by, uh, led by Reverend Douglas E. Moore, who led a sit-in in 1957 at the Royal Ice Cream Parlor in, here in Durham. They were in their teens and 20s when they did this. Three years later, it would go on to inspire the Greensboro Four. Have y'all heard of the Greensboro sit-ins, right? Okay, so that's the more popular sit-ins, but it actually happened three years prior first here in Durham. And with the Greensboro Four, you had four young, brave men who were North Carolina A&T students who sat down at the Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina. They were all 18 and 19 years old, first years in college. Organizations uh, popped up to amplify the sit-in movement and help bring them to scale. Organizations that were led by people your age. Right down the street in Raleigh, there was an organization called SNCC, S-N-C-C. It stands for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, founded by Ella Baker at Shaw University in Raleigh, SNCC pioneered in voter registration, community organizing, freedom schools, and helped transform the civil rights movement with a boost of youthful energy and it was being led by people your age. How many people in here are, are 17 or 18 years old? All of you, because it's juniors and seniors, right? Okay, most of y'all, 16, 17, 18. So it was people your age. You, prob you probably take for granted the fact that if you want some ice cream or a chicken sandwich, you could roll up in a Cold Stone or Bojangles and get you a biscuit. That was not always the case in this country, as we know, and there were restaurants that were for white people and white people only, and then there was everybody else. But it wasn't people my age, I'm 36. I know I don't look it, <laughs> all right? It wasn't people my age or your teacher's ages that were leading these movements. Now, that's not to say there weren't people you know, over 40 involved. There was uh, you know, so many folks of multi-generational, but I'm talking about the on-the-ground radical direct actions like sit-ins were almost exclusively led by people your age. Young people in their teens and 20s that brought this strategic sense of urgency and ushered in a seismic shift in our collective consciousness. So let's do a quick recap. Sankofa, you know, go back and fetch it. We gotta know your history. We have the Royal Ice, in 1957, we have the Royal Ice Cream sit-ins led by North Carolina Central University students in Durham. In 1960, we have the Greensboro Four leading the Woolworths sit-in movement, led by North Carolina A&T students in Greensboro. In that same year, in 1960, we have SNCC, founded by Ella Baker, led by Shaw Un University students in Raleigh. What are the common threads between those three events? Somebody raise your hand so I can call on you. Tell me one of the common threads between those three. Yeah. University students, what kind of university? HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, North Carolina a and North Carolina Central University, and Shaw University. North Carolina has more HBCUs than, than any place in the, any other state in the country. Um, they were led by youth, they were led by HBCU youth, and that's why Dr. King himself made several visits to Durham between 1956 and 1964. He gave over half a dozen speeches within a few miles of this campus, including uh, White Rock Baptist Church in 1960, he addressed a crowd of over a thousand people and he said, let us not fear going to jail if the officials threaten to arrest us for standing up for our rights. Maybe it will take this willingness to stay in jail to arouse the dozing conscience of our nation. 
right? Those were the consequences. So I, <laughs> I want to be clear in comparing the skipping class to the movements of the civil rights leaders. Obviously, the stakes were much higher for the people um, who were leading these sit-in movements. But it was our own act of rebellion, um, which did come with consequences uh, as well, um, that were kind of inspired by King when I was in high school. And if you go to the Durham County Courthouse right now, there's this big wall uh, with a collage of pictures depicting Durham history. You'll see that picture of Dr. King at White Rock Baptist Church in 1960. Um, so this area, North Carolina, we are standing on hallowed ground for the civil rights movement. And I just wanted to, before I let you go in, in closing, I just wanted to remind you of your power. I wanted to let you know that, that young people have been at the vanguard of our social progressive movements. And you, as young people, are very powerful. You might not feel that way because your parents have some authority or your teachers, your dorm parents. There's a lot of people with control over your lives, people telling you what to do. But trust me, you have a lot of power to influence and to change and to create the world and to shape the future that we will inherit. So at the beginning of the presentation, I asked you all to think about something that you wanted to create, something that you wanted to manifest. So that's the first step. After you think about it, remember, words create worlds. Let me hear you say, words create worlds. Words create worlds. All right, so we gotta use our words to speak those things into existence. And after you speak it, there's nothing to it but to do it. It's the action of doing it. So I hope we've planted a seed and, and shared that seed with other folks who can hope, help keep us accountable uh, to what we said we're gonna do, what we intend to create and manifest. And as you move forward in your doing, remember Sankofa, don't forget to look back. And if someone tries to take away your dignity or some inst institution tries to slow your progress, remember that you have the power to take it back. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Freelon. We really appreciate your, your words and, and all that you do day in and day out for Durham, our state, uh, and, and beyond. And, and good luck uh, on your Senate campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we always close today's events by uh, giving the Keeper of the Dream Award. And so uh, each year, the planning, MLK Day Planning Committee accepts nominations for the Keeper of the Dream Award. This award is given to an employee or friend of the school who during their service to the institution and school community has facilitated positive race relations or exhibited leadership in advancing mutual respect, understanding, and appreciation for cultural and ethnic diversity, or encouraged and engaged in off-campus outreach activities and exemplified compassion, goodwill, courage, or leadership. This year we received nominations from students, faculty, and alumni for a number of deserving candidates and I appreciate the committee's work in selecting this year's recipient. Throughout her years of service at NCSSM, this, this year's winner has served as a leader in cultivating respect, understanding, and appreciation for diversity, both on her hall as a community coordinator and throughout the campus community. She serves as a sponsor for the Hispanic Cultures Club, an Asian Cultures Cl Culture Club. In her role as a sponsor, she has helped through the years with several cultural fests. In addition to her responsibilities as a community coordinator, she's helped lead the Student Services Cultural Competency Group. For several years, she coordinated with the American Red Cross to host blood drives on campus. She assisted the school by working with families uh, who speak English as a second language, stepping up to help translate important conversations between uh, student life and, and family members. This led to more proactive efforts, such as translating forms in, uh, in Spanish to provide families. She serves as an advocate for the LGBT plus community, working on several initiatives that have assisted 
uh, the Division of Student Life in the school and creating an inclusive environment. Efforts include coordinating awareness trainings for faculty and staff and the creation of a website that will serve as a resource guide for current and prospective NCSSM students who identify as LGBT plus and their families and allies. For nearly a decade, this person has served NCSSM as an advocate and leader in our community. It's my honor to recognize the 2020 Keeper of the Dream Award, Vanessa Ponce. Again, I want to thank our guest speaker, Mr. Pierce Freelon, our student speakers, Wisdom Talley and Isaiah Hamilton, Mr. Goldston and members of the Colors Gospel Choir, our plan and our planning committee for making this celebration, the celebration this afternoon, a special one. I also want to congratulate again uh, Vanessa for, for all the work that she has done. She is a well, very well deserving recipient. She, has, she, does, she exemplifies, I think, day in and day out, uh, Dr. King's work and, and uh, trying to help our school and community move closer to realizing his dream. And finally, I want to say thank you to each of you uh, in the NCSSM community for your work today uh, and what you do day in and day out for our community, our state, uh, and I hope that you will continue working to achieve Dr. King's dream uh, more than just on a single day where we take this opportunity to recognize him for his work and try to emulate that through our own actions. It's more than a one day thing to achieve the beloved community and Dr. King's dream. So thank you today uh, and enjoy the rest of your day uh, and I hope that you appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>